स्विमर्स इयर इज कॉज बाई विच ऑर्गेनिजम ऑप्शन आर एंट्रोकॉकस सोडोमोना स्टेफेलोकॉक एंड एस्पेटिलस स्विमर्स इयर इज कॉज बाई विच ऑर्गेनिजम ऑप्शन आर एंट्रोकॉकस सोडोमोना स्टेफेलोकॉक एंड एस्पेटिलस This is a repeat from NETSS. This is a repeat from PGIM. This is a repeat from INISS. Right? Swimmer's ear is caused by which organism? Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, and Aspergillus. So the answer is clear. All of you are familiar with this. Pseudomonas is the causative organism for your swimmer's ear. So Pseudomonas causes various manifestation, and all of them have been asked as an MCQ in the super specialty entrance. Right? The so first one, as we now know, swimmer's ear. Right? Swimmer's ear is a form of otitis externa. Swimmer's ear is a form of A simple otitis externa, right? Uncomplicated otitis externa. It is a otitis externa. Okay. Apart from that, Pseudomonas is the most common organism responsible for what is known as malignant otitis externa, right? So we are very much familiar with this from our ENT days in MBBS. Something called as malignant otitis externa used to be a five marks question. Malignant otitis externa. So this is the most common cause, and we know what is the risk factor for malignant otitis externa. when we talk about malignant otitis externa we are talking about diabetes mellitus right okay apart from that this can also cause something known as bath tub folliculitis right bath tub folliculitis can cause bath tub folliculitis then image based question green nail syndrome green nail syndrome i have seen often students get confused it with blue toe syndrome which is a form of the blood vessel occlusion it is a form of a gangrene or ischemia to the digit because of the atherosclerotic occlusion of the blood vessel uh, supplying the gray toe right that is what is known as blue toe syndrome don't confuse that with the green nail syndrome green nail syndrome is due to infection by pseudomonas pseudomonas produces an or produces a pigment called as pyocyanin that attributes to or that contributes to the green hue right green nail syndrome okay then after that i want you to remember something called as shanghai fever Shanghai fever PGIM they have asked twice and it's like one of the repeating template nowadays Shanghai fever is a form of necrotizing enterocolitis necrotizing enterocolitis leading to enterocolitis leading to sepsis and this enterocolitis is acquired through the enteral route of acquisition of infection typically seen in pediatric age group patient and this is a condition which is associated with very very high mortality mortality figures exceeding 70 80% in reported studies right so shanghai fever is caused by pseudomonas so for all these infections pseudomonas is a causative organism clear okay so that was about this swimmers ear now we are moving on to the next question this is a last year uh, inss repeat most common organism causing peritonitis in patients on peritoneal dialysis options are fungi Negative gram negative bacilli, gram positive cocci, and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we are talking about patient who is on peritoneal dialysis, right? Okay. So just a quick recap. I had already posted a very similar question on the Propylada platform. So let me see if we can recall it. Fifty-four year old patient, diabetic on CKD CAPD, presented with fever. Patient reportedly having cloudy effluent in the dialysate bag after exchange. On examination, diffuse abdominal tenderness could be elicited. CAPD catheterization is clear. Dialysate effluent. WBC count was 150 cells per cubic millimeter, and with 60% of them being neutrophils, appropriate next step in the management is right. Options are antibiotic therapy, antibiotics plus CAPD catheter removal, and antibiotics plus antifungals or conservative management. What would you like to do? First point is whether this patient has CAPD peritonitis. What is the diagnostic criteria? If he has CAPD peritonitis, what has been recommended? Just give antibiotics or give antibiotics plus antifungals. Or get rid of the catheter, give antibiotics, or get rid of the catheter, give antibiotics, antifungals. What is the recommendation? Right. This is a little detailed understanding. To answer this question is pretty simple. Right. Okay. Now in CAPD patients, most of the infections are acquired from the external source. So there is a communication between the external environment and the peritoneal cavity in the form of this CAPD catheter. And mostly it is the skin commensals which cause the infection. Right. So please remember it is gram positive cocci. CAPD peritonitis is most commonly caused by staphylococci most likely cons or staph epidermidis right so nowadays most often it is caused by staph epidermidis but again you have to also keep in mind that mrsa incidence is increasing 
though it is traditionally said to be staph aphidermis as the most common cause or cons as the most common cause for CAPD peritonitis because of frequent hospital visits for the patients who are on CAPD right they might develop MRSA peritonitis also they may be colonized with MRSA and they might develop MRSA peritonitis but in, in simple words it is gram positive cocci for sure there is no doubt about it right okay now how do we suspect and how do we diagnose so most likely the patient presents with the complaint that his uh, dialysate effluent after he is exchanging he'll note he will notice that it is becoming cloudy all patients who are on CAPD will be instructed to look for the cloudiness of the dialysate effluent so and if they notice they will present it or they may be also having some mild degree of abdominal pain and they may be having fever right so when they present with such features we will do the effluent dialysate fluid analysis we are not doing the peritoneal puncture and doing the analysis like in case of ascitic fluid like for the diagnosis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis here whatever dialysate effluent is there we are analyzing the WBC symptom right so I am talking about dialysate effluent fluid analysis dialysate effluent fluid analysis so in the dialysate effluent fluid analysis if there are more than 100 WBCs right, per ml and if more than 50% of them more than 100 WBCs and more than 50% of them are polymorphonuclear cells or your neutrophils that satisfies the diagnostic criteria for CAPD peritonitis okay so remember for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis this number was 250 right so this number was 250 right uh, in fact if you just talk about WBCs it is uh, 500 and 50% of the polymorphonuclear cells should be there that means we are talking about 250 polymorphonuclear cells in case of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. In case of CEPD peritonitis, we are talking about 100 WBCs with of which more than 50% should be polymorphonuclear cells. Okay, so does this patient satisfy the criteria? Yes, he satisfies that. WBC count is 150 more than 100, 60% are neutrophils, so that kind of satisfies. So this patient is having CAPD peritonitis. Clear? Okay, now in terms of management, what do we do? We have to treat them with antibiotics and because there are frequent hospital exposures apart from gram positive cocci there is also a theoretical risk of gram negative infections so we have to cover for that so when we start treatment we start empirically using a cocktail which covers gram positives and gram negatives well and because we are aware that cons is a problem we have to include vancomycin in the regimen right so for gram positive coverage vancomycin should also be there because we have to cover for cons right so you start with an antibiotic covering gram positive also vancomycin plus you give a adequate gram negative coverage pseudomonas is also a problem so you also give a adequate pseudomonas coverage once you have the culture you can step down on antibiotics right that is the initial approach so you have to have gram positive coverage negative coverage and pseudomonas coverage and every time you treat a CAPD peritonitis patient with antibiotics we have to keep in mind that antifungals need to be added otherwise these patients we frequently develop uh, antifungal I mean the fungal colonization right and that can become problematic so we have to add antifungals you cannot merely treat them with antibiotics alone right antifungals need to be added and the antifungal of choice is nistatin oral nistatin oral and the duration of treatment is around two to three weeks the maximum is three weeks some infections might require only two weeks of treatment okay okay now there is one more question to address should we remove the catheter or not right so let us look at what the professional guideline says the American Society of Nephrologists, it is the latest guideline that I am projecting. It says catheter removal is to be considered in two circumstances, right? Where even if at presentation there is catheter site infection, right? You don't need to jump to remove the catheter. Give a good antibiotic treatment. And if patient is not showing clinical improvement in the form of peritonitis, peritonitis itself is not improving. Despite giving a five days of antibiotics, then get rid of the catheter. Peritonitis not improving after five days of antibiotics, get rid of the catheter. Or if peritonitis is showing improvement, right? You completed the full course of treatment, which is usually two to three weeks, right? So maximum duration is around three weeks, or you can stretch it to four weeks if it is pseudomonas infection. You have completed the full course of antibiotics, and in that case, peritonitis has resolved, but the uh, the catheter site infection is not resolved. Then you think of removal. So only two circumstances. Right? Even if there is a catheter site infection, we are not removing it. We are starting with antibiotics. At the end of five days of antibiotics, we are not seeing improvement at all. Then you get rid of the catheter. Or if you are noticing improvement, then you will complete the entire course of antibiotics. During this course of antibiotics, if peritonitis improves but catheter site infection persists, then you get rid of the catheter. Only these two circumstances, catheter removal is advocated. Right? Otherwise, catheter removal is not required. Okay. So now. Let us go back to those questions, solve them and then move on.
So in this case, the answer is pretty straightforward, right? So we are talking about gram positive cocci. So the right answer is gram positive cocci. Okay. The next question, clear understanding. This is a case of CAPD peritonitis. CAPD peritonitis, right? Diagnosis satisfies it. And they have also mentioned that the catheter site is clear. Anyway, at this point of time, I will not be thinking of catheter removal. Even if that mentioned catheter site is not clear, the first step is antibiotics only. Catheter removal is only when after five days, no improvement or only peritonitis improves even after completing the full course of antibiotics. But catheter site infection is not cleared, then you think of catheter removal, right? So antibiotic ther therapy alone, no option. You have to consider antifungals also. Antibiotics plus catheter, CAPD catheter removal, no, not the right option. Right. Antibiotics plus antifungals, yes, that is a definite right answer. So option C is the correct answer for the question. Right? Clear? Option C is the right answer. And the nystatin is our antifungal choice. Conservative treatment, absolutely no. Right? CAPD peritonitis itself can be associated with very high mortality. Okay, so that concludes the question. We have learned some key points about CAPD peritonitis today. Okay, so with that, I'll be winding for this session of infectious disease. <music>